Thank you. And we have some jobs that we're looking to fill at our place as well. They're not up there. One of them actually is after the day I had today, one of them actually is for being sheriff. So um, <laughs> if you're interested, we can work it out tonight. Um, I'll be very happy. Um, but we actually do have some IT positions we're looking to fill at our place. So we'll get more information to you so you can post it next time you have your meeting. Um, and really, that's somewhat why I'm here to talk to you tonight. Because, I mean, I guess some of you would ask yourselves, you know, what's the sheriff got to tell us that's going to be relevant to what we're doing here? And truly, my primary message to you folks is please think about destroying your life like I have destroyed mine. Yes, please, please, come, come work for government. Um, it will crush any spirit you have left, and you can then... <laughs> now, in all seriousness, I mean, we need people like you to get engaged with government. I'm not just talking about voting. Yes, we all need to do that. But to actually engage with us, whether it's actually working with us or working with us in some other indirect way. We need that. And I often mention to people, I go, why is, why is that so important? Well, it's not just so that we can have the best and greatest office in the world. We all, I believe, should be very, very concerned about our individual legacies. You know, it's, it's easy to get caught up in the here and now and what's going on this minute and the greatest, latest, newest event, invention, app, whatever it might be. But the reality is every, every generation forever has been judged by posterity. And we will as well. We will. And you think about generations long gone. And you think to yourself, they probably thought very well of themselves at that moment. They probably did. I often particularly reflect on uh, England in like the 1850s. Because that, at that point in time, they were everything. They were the country. They ruled everything. They said the sun never set on the English um, empire because they were everywhere. But yet, when most people think of England in the 1850s, it's usually defined by their probably one of their preeminent authors, Charles Dickens. And when people think of that, are getting this warm, fuzzy feeling about how England was in that period? Oh, God, no. God, no. They think of it as this horrific place because of how they treated the poor, how they treated the mentally ill, how they treated people who didn't fit into their society, and their treatment for them, frankly, was we locked them all up. That's just what they did. And it was actually quite accurate. And so then when people are sitting there thinking about their legacy, well, I guarantee you most of the people at that point in time thought they were quite enlightened, and they're going to be viewed very well by posterity. I, I, I'm here to tell you that the way we treat those same categories of people, the poor, the mentally ill, the less fortunate, is no different than they were treated. And we are going to have that exact same moniker, that we were horrible, horrible people. And there won't be any way to duck and dodge and work our way around it and sort of spin it that, no. Because I, I'm here to tell you, as the person who runs the first or second largest jail in the country, uh, we do not treat people well. We do not. We routinely, out of pure indifference, pure indifference, lock up the mentally ill, in astounding numbers, astounding numbers. It's always at least a third of my population, so I usually have about 3,000 people who are acutely mentally ill, they're in my custody. Most of them in there, because why? Because they're mentally ill. And it's not because they, created the, they committed this horrific crime. No, they were stealing something to eat, they were caught trying to sleep somewhere and they're not supposed to be, so we lock them up. Then we have poor people we dump in there as well. And then we have people that sit in there for extended periods of time with no real thought as to what we're doing. And in the world that so many of you operate in, where you see technology and all the wonders of it, none of that is engaged in the criminal justice system. We have crept into it. We have crept into it. And I often say to people, think about it. If you were to line up the most impactful things that any government can do to the people in their community, any government, I would suggest to you the first thing would be to execute them. That would be number one, the most impactful. I would say right behind it is to incarcerate them. I think we'd all agree. And so I would suggest that most people in a thoughtful society would say, okay, if the most, second most impactful thing, we are going to make sure this has got the, the greatest amount of scrutiny, we put our best people on it, and we can take every innovation we have to make sure it is being done thoughtfully. And I'm here to tell you none of that is being done. None of that. 
absolutely none of it. When I became sheriff in 2008, the entire jail management system, so running the entire place, the largest jail, was a DOS-based computer system. Hmm? I often tell people, it was amazing if I could tell you who was in the place, let alone, you know, why they were there, how long they were there, all those things. But once again, no one really particularly cared about that. And then, wandering around, you couldn't help but be overcome by the fact that so many of the people in there were severely mentally ill. But they were treated no differently than someone who was in there who had no mental illness, who had been committing horrible crimes. Because we didn't distinguish it. When we would have stabbings in the jail, which we used to have routinely, I would ask people when I first got in, what did they stab each other with? And they would always tell me, they, uh, it was a shank, Sheriff. And I was like, okay. And wh what, what are they made out of? Um, shanks. I was like... Okay, all right, all right, okay. Where are they coming from? The jail. Okay, this is going nowhere, right? Right, right, Sheriff, you're right. This is going nowhere. So I said, okay, let's do something really novel. Let's take all the shanks, we'll categorize all of them, we'll find out where they came from in the jail, and then we'll surgically go about removing them. And it's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Like, well, where do we keep all the shanks? We don't know. I was like, oh, fascinating, fascinating. Um, so after about a two-week odyssey, I was able to locate them. And in doing that, I literally laid them all out in my office on the floor, and there were thousands of them. And in doing that, we were able w immediately to find out where they were all coming from. It didn't take a rocket scientist. But all of these different things were being done by hand. No one was categorizing anything. There was no data involved with anything. And think about it. Just holding that body, how do we hold people then and still do? We use triplicate pieces of paper. Triplicate pieces of paper. Now, is that a thoughtful society? And literally, the triplicate pieces of paper are being handwritten by a clerk. In cursive, and we have that dropped at us at about 5, 6, 7 o'clock at night, and we're there to determine whether or not to let this person walk out of the jail, put him back in the cell, or send him down to the prison system. Are mistakes made? Oh, God, how could they not be made? But yet, once again, this is how we think of this. We are indifferent at best. And so, when I became sheriff, we immediately went about trying to write this thing, and, and we have some amazing things we're doing now in regards to the jail management system that we have is fantastic. It's state of the art. We now have data that we use to track all sorts of incidents in the jail, whether it's people being attacked, movement, things like that. We still have triplicates. Why? Because we aren't in charge of that. It's another county entity, and everyone's in their silos, so they don't really talk a lot, and so people just keep moving on. But the other part of it, too, is so when we all are rightfully so outrageously distressed about the violence in our community and what is going on in the streets of Chicago, think about this for a second. How about the fact that virtually every person involved in the criminal justice system who is there to try to come up with the innovations was obsessed with the notion is where we do this is we do this when they're released from prison. Okay, sounds good, common sense, whatever, I guess. How about if they aren't coming out of the prison? How about if last year alone, we released out of the jail 40,000 people from the jail? The entire prison system released under 30,000. So while everyone's focusing on, we've got to get these prison programs, got to get these prison programs, I'm the one that's spewing the most people out of jails. But sheriffs were never supposed to do any programming to fix people while they're in the jail, because theoretically, I'm supposed to hold them for this narrow window of time. Because prisons are where you go to serve a sentence, Jails, you just are sitting there waiting on your trial. So sheriffs were never supposed to really get involved with programming because they're just supposed to be in there for a short period of time waiting for their trial. That's not what occurs in Cook County, though. I have, um, I think, two people that are waiting on their trial now 10 years. I think uh, two nine years and three have been waiting eight years. And then after that, the numbers get huge, really huge. The number have been waiting five years, six years. Not guilty yet. They're just waiting on their trial. So here I am sitting on all these people. Nobody but me cared to really get into the, da the data to find out what exactly is it that we are impacting the community with. Come to find out that 85% of the people that come into my jail go straight from the jail back to the community. Where, what communities are they going to? The communities with the most violence. And yet, the theory was that jails were not supposed to be working with people to make them better because they're not going to be with me very long and they all go to the prison. Well, how about the fact no one looked at the data? No one looked at it. Why did they not look at, about, at it? No one cared. No one cared. We can dress this one up any way we want. No one cared. And so we have these communities that are horrifically struggling, and we're just pumping more and more broken people into them.
So what we did is we went about changing things. We did, went about changing it by using a lot of data, a lot of technology to start mapping where people come to us from, where they're going when they leave, programs that we can hopefully keep them in when they leave, and particularly with the mentally ill population, to really track them and treat them like patients. We discharge plan for them, which is unheard of anywhere in the country. And we do this with this thoughtful type of thread that is like, okay, we are at the hub of this. We can help fix this. But as I told you, and I know my time is running short here, um, this is indicative of this bigger picture of a careless, thoughtless society that just doesn't care because these are other people. These are somebody else's headaches and problems. And that is what usually defines us. Our eviction process, when I became sheriff as well, was the eviction process that still goes on all around the country, which is we get an order to evict somebody, we show up at the door, we take them and their children, we take them to the street, and we throw all their stuff in the street. And then we're off to our next one, and next one, next one. In spite of the fact that we had the ability, which we did pretty quickly, to take the data about when evictions occur, to get to homes beforehand, get a social worker to the home, to work with the family, to connect them to services, transportation, schooling for their ch children if they're going to be going to a different location, it wasn't that hard. But we didn't have anybody who was focused on data and analysis, analysis. That is where we are really at the lowest, analysis, getting people to use their brain. So in all different aspects of the office, it was that common thread going through it, that this is something we as a society do not care about. And so for yourselves, I, I have a lot more I could talk about. I already know I'm running out of time here. But it really is a challenge for particularly the young folks here, for your generation, to sort of turn around what we screwed up and to get engaged with these things. And as I said, it, can, it runs the gamut from literally becoming an employee in our office to someone who just interacts with our office with ideas and thoughts. And the one thing I've always told people about the criminal justice system, the absolute beauty of it is there's no conceivable way you can screw it up any worse than it is. So <laughs> how about that for a starting point? So when we come up with new programs, there, we're, we're trying new programs all the time there because it's like the only way we're going to try to make a dent in this. And so we're seeing a lot of positive results on this and what we've been working on. And we see a very, very bright future, but it's going to require us to get more and more people. I cannot tell you how hard it is for us to get young, talented people to come work for us. It is next to impossible. And I understand straight up that people can make a lot more money in a lot of other areas, but I truly feel this is going to be something that's going to define all of us later on. And it'll be too late by then. It'll be too late. And so collectively, I just ask you to think about that and think about where you want to be viewed 100 years from now, how you want to be viewed 100 years from now. Because as I say, it's something we need to think about now. I think I possibly could be out of time now, Christopher, or should I keep rolling? Because I got so much more I can do. Um, uh, um, four minutes? OK, cool, I can do that. Um, but so as I said, think about it. So we have the, the, the gun violence issue going on in our city right now. It's horrific. It's very, very difficult right now because it's no longer as predictable as it used to be. So a lot of different predictive models have been used over the years to try to get out in front of violence and look at retaliation, things like that. A lot of those models aren't working anymore. And it's not because there's not smart people involved with it. The nature of the gang structure has dramatically changed. And social media has fed into this as well. So whereas you used to have strong gangs where a lot, a lot of homicides, don't get me wrong, it wasn't like the glory years of Jeff Ford and Larry Hoover, boy, I wish I had those back. No, <laughs> they were violent, more murders, and all the rest of it. The murders had some type of logical thread to it. They were moving in on someone's territory. They were trying to send a message. They would stop murders from happening, things like that, because there was a business model they were trying to advance. None of that applies anymore. It does not. And so as a result of that, attempting to get out in front of the homicides, very, very difficult. Very difficult. The other part of it, too, I used to be a prosecutor years ago. And I can tell you the one thing for sure when you're prosecuting a case, you cannot prosecute a case if you have no witnesses. And so when you have communities that don't trust law enforcement, you don't have any witnesses. And think about this for a second, folks. When you have a criminal justice system that many of these people in this community have been mistreated by, at best been treated indifferently, how excited do you think they're going to be to come forward and get involved with trying to help law enforcement solve crimes? They're not. And then you add to it the, the, the threats and the, the fact that they don't see people being taken off the street and arrested. So if they come forward, they're going to get harmed. And so the, the cycle of violence continues, and it goes on and on and on. And there is, 
no, so, uh, there's no uh, end in sight if we're just looking at it from that standpoint. What we did is we started playing around the data in our place. And so we targeted youth, um, young offenders, 18 to 24, coming from the 15 most violent zip codes. And we put them in this really unique program that is six to eight hours a day of cognitive uh, programming, all sorts of really neat programs, most of which I can't remember right now. Um, but are really incredible. They come at it from a really different angle. It talks about fathering. It talks about jobs. It talks about a lot of it, but it's very, very deep. And we've been doing it for about a year now, and it's one living unit because we just made this up. I mean, just like I told you, you, you can't screw this thing up. We made it up. And we picked people from all different gangs from these zip codes. They're all living together. Normally on the street, they'd be shooting each other. We've had like zero violence within the living unit, which is unheard of. But more importantly, we've had little over 100 people graduate, for lack of a better word, out of our program. We've had many more in there, but because of the nature of it, the people will plead guilty. They'll get sent to prison in the middle of the program so they don't finish it. But we've had just over 100 leave the program in the course of a year. So, and so this is actually very scalable. Um, and of that 100, only one person has been charged with an act of violence. And I'm in no way trying to minimize domestic violence, but the only person charged with an act of violence was for a domestic violence case, which are somewhat unpredictable, not a lot you can do to get out in front of those because you never know when something's going to explode within a house. My only point, though, is these were the type of people who traditionally would be seen as the people who are either going to shoot or be shot, and not one of them has done that. And so can we fix some of this stuff? Absolutely we can fix some of this stuff. But it requires us to really dive into this thing with a passion that we can fix it and get very smart people in the room to start testing the different things that we know could impact these communities. It's very, very difficult. Many of the communities we're sending people back to, I would suggest to you most of them, are somewhat devoid of a lot of the support services that you would find in a lot of other communities. So it is tricky. In our brilliant state of Illinois, God love them, they're so far, they've decided to decimate what few services are still out there because of the dysfunction in the state. So they've made it even more challenging, but there still are things out there that we have been working on, that other people are working on, that we see lots of glimmers of hope. So there's things we can do, but we just need to get the right people engaged in this. Because otherwise, I'm exaggerating, I wish it was. I was trying to bring some of this trip. I think we're the only people keeping the triplicate form people in business these days. <laughs> Nobody else does this stuff. Um, we, we gotta get beyond that, and we can do that. But we really need help from people like yourselves. Thank you. Hi, you talked a little bit about the challenges of recruiting. Um, so I, I'm wondering, one, do you require a four-year CS degree? Two, um, I guess could you talk more generally about what you think, why you think there are challenges? And then three, what the mitigations are for that? Um, we do not require that. Um, we're very flexible in regards to that. Um, I think a lot of the issues that we've had in attempting to get people in there is that people have certain preconceived notions about government for starters, but then law enforcement in general, that we are some like dinosaurs and our, you know, we, we gotta arrest our way out of this problem, we gotta arrest our way out of this one, and then people rightfully say, I don't want anything to do with that, that's, that's stupid. So we've been trying to communicate to people, we are on the other end of the spectrum that we're actually less into, like uh, prostitution, for years law enforcement, all they did, and most of them still do it, they just arrest prostitutes. We were like, no, no, no. The, the women are victims. We got to treat them like victims. So we need to get them into services and arrest the people that are manipulating them. And that's been interesting because we've been hiring former prostitutes. I think I have four of them working for me now. And so for us, it was always like, okay, let's take these from a different angle and how can we be thoughtful and innovative? And I mentioned it before jokingly, but seriously, we can't make it any worse. So it's like when someone's going to challenge you and say, listen, well, that isn't, you know, we can't do that because that's something that could ra uh, raise the recidivism rate. I'd be like, um, how could it get any worse? It can't. They're already coming back in, in the jail all the time. So I think there's these preconceived notions that keep people from looking to come work for people like us. But I have, I don't know how many open IT-related positions right now, and I probably don't do a very good job of knowing where to go to look for people. Um, but yeah, I was watching your board up there, and I was going to try to handwrite something on the wall here. Um, <laughs> but. Um, but yeah, those I think are the biggest issues we have. And I don't blame people. As I say, most people in law enforcement, good, good people, but my God, like dragging them into the 21st century is tricky. 
Hi, uh, question is, what sort of uh, concrete services applications or analysis can you envision that would make the most difference out of the gate? You know, if people were to put their minds to it right now and make it, would you like to see first? You know, you know it's, it, it's, it's interesting, but I think that if we were to somewhat leave the criminal justice world for a, a second and just think to ourselves that this individual in the jail, they, they run the spectrum, they really do. The, the, the largest group of them are a combination of mentally ill and individuals who've made mistakes, made mistakes. The smaller percentage, it's probably in the area of 30, are very violent people, very violent. And so what I've always tried to do is try to really segregate these different populations because they each need a different type of strategy attached to them. And so from my standpoint, if the, the bigger group, the 70% group, if that was a group that we were to treat almost as if they're patients and sit there and say, okay, we are going to do a really deep dive data-wise onto what their background is. And I'm not just talking their criminal background, their family background, the issues that probably led them there. It's easy to get that. Most, these, these folks that we bring in, they will talk to us. They trust us. They actually, more often than not, when I'm wandering around the jail, they think I'm their public defender. And they're always coming to me asking about their case. And it's like, oh, no, you can't tell me that. I might be a witness against you. So you, you <laughs> probably need to. But, but I, I think if people would come up with a model for me, because I have the ability at intake, because my, my jail management system is, I, I couldn't give you the details of it, but it's Microsoft-based. It's very, very, you know, we understand it's one of the best. But we have the ability at intake to, frankly, ask people virtually anything, and they will tell us that. So I would need someone much smarter than me and say, Tom, if you were to ask them these five questions and then research the area that they came from, we could come up with a strategy that makes sense for this type of person who's committed this type of crime. Um, it's really what, I, I, as I say, if you think of them more as a broken person who needs help and you're going to sort of hold their hand out of there, you will have successes. They, they don't want to be coming back in there. They, they mean, they do not. The mentally ill, it's a little tricky at times because we treat them so well. Most of them say that's the best they've ever been treated. So that gets a little bit tricky. But it's coming up with what type of data would somebody want that would help us integrate someone into a community that does not have a lot of the support systems, and then, but then take it beyond that and say, okay, now Tom, in a successful community, we've researched these are the type of support systems they have to have. Because I know one of them is like mental health support services, and the city had gone through a lot of reshuffling, and they shut down six of their 12 mental health clinics. I reopened one of them, because when I, I heat mapped the area, I found this disproportionate number of detainees were mentally ill were all going there, and there was no services for them. And so we operate it now. Didn't cost me any money, because I take some of my mental health professionals, and I move them three days a week over to that location to work their caseload there. But my only point, though, is, is that um, through a thoughtful analysis of fixing broken people, be very, very you know, broad here. You can come up with multiple strategies. And once again, someone much smarter than me and say, Tom, can you break everybody down into the people with drug offenses who have only been arrested once, who has a high school degree, um, somebody who has, you know, I, I can add all those in. I just need someone smarter than me and say, Tom, here's the universe, here's what the strategy is. Um, so first, uh, full disclosure, I'm working on a project with Paul Vallis. Um, oh, thank you. And um, I know the Chicago State thing has thrown us a curveball, though. So we're Yeah, well, he's a little busy now, but we're still working on it. Um, so the question I have is, what you're talking about is great, fantastic, but a lot of the data you want is out in the communities, in some of the social work, you know, among the people who are doing social work. And I'm just wondering, you know, wouldn't it be important to try to figure out how to merge all this together in a kind of case management way? So you could do the things you're doing in the jail, and when people manage to get out or wherever they go, there's some follow-up rather we, than... We're doing what, that, but here's the, the hitch is because of all of the cuts that the state has done, I have less and less partners to connect with out there. And so like that particular program, I, frankly, typical me, I, I really I missed the whole like hook. That's the program we call for the 18 to 24-year-olds that we've had us looking. The big hook is, after all this programming there, we hand them off to a community partner, and we have like six or eight community partners who've been awesome, who literally, they, they almost adopt them. They work with them, that's their case management. And so we've, we've thrown it out to a lot of people. We have certain groups that we work very closely with, but all of them, they're hanging by a thread right now. And honestly, God, I come into a room, they go running out the door because they know I'm looking for help, and 
boy, I've got 10 detainees for you. And they're like, oh, uh, no, no, we have nothing. Um, so we, we've tried that integration. We have a, I believe, um, we have some type of app that we put together that has tried to even take that a step further, but I don't know how far that one developed because that was an intern that was working on that. Um, so on that note, what kinds of methods do you have for gathering resources to fund these programs? Because I sort of had a similar question that there are there is a ton of research available, of course, and how do you decide, or how are you going to fund those applications and the service partners, the community partners that are doing this work, because that's a huge issue as well. Yeah, I mean the funding is always a problem. I don't try to minimize that, but where we have found um, a great deal of luck, for lack of a better word, is we did, have done a lot of work, some of it more recently, on attaching some really strict metrics to the programs we do have. And in doing that, we found there's quite a few programs that just don't work. There's no data to support doing them. So in doing that, we've reduced a lot of programs, and then we've been sliding money over into some of the other ones that are working better. Um, and so it's not like I have an unlimited pool of money, but I have not had to go to the county board for a dime on any of the mental health stuff we've done, which has become the model for the whole country. That was just reprioritizing all the different places we had already squirreled away money. So yeah, that's finite, and I understand that. But the one, I'll be honest with you, the one thing I've told people over and over again, and I, I know you're not suggesting this, but I meet with so many people that come with these great ideas, but I need a million for this, two million for that. And I said, listen, I will stand with you, I will help you, whatever grant you want to apply for, and we'll get that in motion. But in the meantime, I have about 200 people a day I'm discharging to the community we have to have a sense of urgency. And so we need to sort of wing things. So a lot of the stuff I've done is I'm just trying to make it better. You know, I have my perfect up here, but in the meantime, I can't just wait for that. Because that's the one thing, I'll tell you what, I am definitely, um, you know, I, it's been, I, I don't play well with others is one of my many monikers, and it's absolutely accurate, absolutely accurate. Because I was, unfortunately, I was sentenced to 11 years in Springfield in the legislature, and it was 11 of the most painful years when you know, Rome's burning all around us. You know what? We're going to have a task force to study that. We've got a new committee to look at that. We're going to analyze that. I was like, this, we, we can't wait, folks. And so most of the people I've interacted with in government over the years, they can't find an issue that they can't study enough. And in the meantime, real people are really hurting. And so if we can just move the, you know, the dial a little bit while we're trying for this big, you know, solution, that's huge. And that's where we have found a lot of our breakthroughs on things that we are just winging it. And people then start getting more excited and they start donating more things to us. Because one of the other aspects of what I've been doing is I've been doing a lot of programming in the jail. Some people question what my motive is. Part of my motive is not necessarily, because a lot of it's not scalable, and I understand that. Like we have a really wild cooking program. We've got this, this Italian chef that comes in there for free, teaches them how to make pasta by hand, their sauces. It's ridiculously good. And uh, we got a friend of ours to give us 16,000 bucks for a, um, a wood-burning pizza oven that's in the middle in the Division 11. They learned that. It's a very viable skill when they get out, but I can't teach a lot of people that. But the other part of it is I'm working to sell that to the public out in front of the jail. Why? I'll, I'll make money, and that'll help defray the cost, but the other part is to humanize the people in the jail so people can see them in a different light. That, wow, this person... I interacted with, he sounded like a decent person, he made this, it's delicious, you know, you'd start changing people. We have a, a stall at the Daily Center at the Farmer's Market. We make a little bit of money there, but it's mostly so I can get people interacting with inmates in a different environment. So we have some money, we've been able to redirect some money, we've killed off some really long-standing programs that had no results attached to them. We used to run a boot camp. Back in like the 80s and early 90s, they were all the rage. And uh, frankly, underlying it was, it made people feel tough. You know, we get to go yell at people and make them do push-ups and sit-ups. And then no one studied it. And so we started looking at it ourselves and we found out there was absolutely, not, I shouldn't say that, there, the data showed that if you went to our boot camp, and you compared it to a cohort of identical people, you were more likely to offend if you went to my boot camp. And I was like, um, I think we can end this one. I think, uh, 
um, feel pretty good about this one. But so I, basically I took the funding of it and I took the location, which is the somewhat bucolic setting away from the jail, and I turned it into my mental health treatment center, which is a more appropriate place to have mentally ill people if we as a society still insist on locking them up. They're in Quonset huts, gardens are all around them, things like that. But so there's been a lot of like moving things around, but that is finite and your point is very well taken, that the money is an issue. And think about it too. It is hard to try to get money for these type of causes because people are like, they're a bunch of criminals, just tell them to stop committing crimes. I was like, okay, I'll try that one. You know, I'll go talk to them right now. Hey guys, stop committing crimes. Hey, solved, they, they said they won't. It's like, are you a, <laughs> you a moron? I mean, you've got to be kidding me. So that's where, particularly in the environment we're in now, with these people with their very simplistic little ideas on how we can turn this thing around, they are not helpful. Any of the th things that we really are going to do to try to solve these issues, you have to be in it for the long term. You absolutely have to be, because this got screwed up over many decades to fix it. It's going to take time, but we're, we're already moving it. We're moving it, and we just need more people to help accelerate this. For a number of years up until 2013, your office was working with uh, Loyola and putting out public data about like population, length of stay, and those kind of public uh, reporting. Um, but that stopped in 2013. And uh, so do you have any thoughts about why that stopped and if there's been any public data or reporting aside from your press releases to replace that? And do you have any, ch uh, any suggestions for how to, do you have any ideas for how you're going to provide more public data about, um, about these things in the future? Yeah, you know, we had been working with Loyal. Loyal has been fantastic. We've had an ongoing relationship with them. I can't remember the exact rationale behind the data stopping at that point in time, but we have since put up a ton of more data, which it has, you know, the population, uh, racial breakdown, um, offenses. We now have a new, um, I'm trying to remember, we have a new dashboard that if it isn't up now, it's going up in the next couple of weeks that's going to have all length of stay on there. Um, and trust me, I'm not trying to, I love Loyola. They're my, I love them. Um, I think there was problems with the, the, the data, not from their side, but what they were working with. And so um, that was, I think, one of the little glitches there. But we have a pretty robust one now, and it's about to get a lot better. But the one thing I'll tell you what, that we've never been accused of is shielding data from people. It's always been a question of, is it accurate? Because once again, when I get back to what we've been working with, because you think about it, a lot of the information that they were wanting to put up on this required you literally to go by hand to the, um, to literally go by hand to the clerk's computer. So you'd have to leave our system to manually go to the clerk's computer to find out why this person's been in custody for eight years you'd have to find out these are all by agreement continuances. It's very, very laborious. We've gotten some of that under control, but as I mentioned before, most of the data, at least from the clerk's office, is still on paper. So it's very, very tricky. So I don't know, I can't recall, to be honest with you, the exact rationale, but our relationship with Loyola is very, very solid. We have a robust, I mean, the biggest criticism I get is from my own employees that I put all these videos up all the time when there's been attacking detainees and things like that. So. Uh, the one thing we haven't been accused of is hiding data. We, they, we've been accused of putting way too much up. Hi. Um, I was wondering how you went about getting one of the mental health clinics that closed open again, like how you went about collecting the data or doing the necessary advocacy to open that up again. You know, it, it actually wasn't as hard as you would think because we'd been heat mapping the population as they left us. So we'd have all the data. Great. Thank you. We, we had all the data already because of the way we house people based on their acuity level and things like that. Most of the, pe the people that we work with really like us. And so they were very happy to stay connected with us when they would leave and go back to the community. So we were getting a load of data from them at the outset. Then through the heat mapping, it was abundantly clear there was this big gap in this one location. The city was great to work with. They, uh, the alderman um, Maldonado, he worked with us extensively and he leases it to us for a dollar. A dollar a year, he gave us the clinic, and then we just, you know, staff it. And it's been really neat. So we have, a lot of them are detainees we've released to the community. They bring a lot of their families in with them as well. And now they're bringing in some of, like, their, you know, friends and things like that that have issues. So it was really, I'll be honest with you, it was sort of what I mentioned earlier. It was more, it was one of those, let's, let's try something. You know, as opposed to sitting here and just whining, they shut down the clinics, they shut down the clinics. Yes, we're, we're against that. That wasn't a good decision. But 
what can we do about it? And we, as a staff, we got together and said, okay, here's what we can do. We got another family to donate this van to us because we had worked very closely with their daughter when she was in our custody, and she'd been in custody numerous times, and horrible things had happened. And, we, um, and we'd started working with her, and we got her on track, and she's been great for about three or four years now. So the family set up a 501c3. They did fundraisers, and they bought us a van. We use the van that when people are leaving the jail and they don't have a place to go, we'll either drive them to a shelter, or if they can't get to their family, we drive them to their house. If they have doctor's appointments they can't get to after they've released from our custody, we use the van to get them back and forth to doctor's appointments. And so we're just making a lot of this stuff up as we go along, which this notion is, the underlying is, I, honestly, God, is, what would you want, how would you want someone to be treated if this was your relative? And in doing that, it's not that tricky. Thank you so much.